All right, welcome everybody. Um, we're going to call the meeting of the Plymouth School Committee to order. It is 7.03. And if everyone would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. The Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. And to the, to the republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, justice for all. All right. Hi, welcome everybody and welcome to everybody at home. And um, it's nice, uh, we're all nice and dry and safe tonight. Um, the first thing that we are going to do, well, we have, uh, I believe we have no comments today from the general public. So we're gonna move right into our student representatives. And we have Karen Fan from Plymouth North and Alexander Godfrey from Plymouth South. Are you guys, I know I have to always ask, are you gonna to present together or separately? Together? Together. All right, so um, it's the floor is all yours. All right, thank you so much. Hi, Mr. Parslin. Um, <laughs> and so we are back with another presentation while Alex gets that up. Um, we are super excited to be back um, for our new month. Um. It's not coming up as a sharing option. Oh. I got this. It should be. Can you see it, Karen? Yes. I put all the settings so everyone should be able to. I made it so anyone could share. Floor is yours, Alex. Okay. So today is the first day of February and was a half day because of um, pending snowstorm issues. Tomorrow begins the new hybrid learning rules where students will be receiving an additional um, 15 minutes of live instruction on their off school days. Read more about that in Plymouth North's newspaper, The Eagle, written by senior Caroline Richards. All right, so upcoming dates for students. Um, on Tuesday, February 2nd, which is tomorrow, learn from home login requir requirement begins for the silver cohort. On Wednesday, it will be required for the blue cohort. On February 5th, report cards will be published to Aspen portals for all students. On February 5th, also um, report cards will go home with silver cohort students. On February 8th will be a remote Monday, but it's also a half day. So students should finish their classes by 11 a.m. On February 9th, the term two report cards go home with the blue cohort students. And on February 12th, remote students semester one report cards will be mailed home. And from February 13th to the February 21st will be February break. Um, so Chromebooks have been um, in distribution. The handbook, which is um, linked, overviews all the necessary information for safe and appropriate use of Chromebooks. Um, the loan of technology agreement must be signed by both the student and the parent and returned to your child's cable lock teacher prior to Chromebook distribution. The form is attached in the email that um, this message was sent in. And this week, freshmen will be receiving Chromebooks during K-Block and sophomores are upcoming. Um, to receive a new Chromebook, students must turn in a signed loan agreement form, return any other pro, um, Chromebooks that they were given in the past before receiving a new one. Seniors at North were reminded that Ms. Harrison is putting together the senior spotlight bios for athletes again this year. Um, they were reminded through Mr. Parsons page um, to fill out the link at their earliest convenience. Um, the local scholarship has been extended to Wednesday to hand in the printed A ASR form and the essay. No late applications are accepted. 
also purchase a yearbook because of course who wouldn't want to remember this year and class rings are also available as well. For South seniors, the scholarship application deadline was also moved to Wednesday only for the essay and the um, SAR form, but the regular scholarship was due at um, 2 15 p.m. today. That was the Google form version. Um, four year college bound seniors, the NIA scholarship is now available for applications. This is a four year renewable scholarship up to $12,000 and based on a student's academic extracurricular record. Um, as well as their quality of written responses on the application. It's due to Mrs. Mueller, Mula, um, no later than Friday, April 2nd. Parents and guardians of seniors will receive a list of dates from Mrs. Fry before February vacation. Um, it's unknown exactly what senior activities will look like this year, but we wanna make parents aware of events that might be up and coming, so keep an eye out. So the Eagles are flying high. Despite all the challenges we are facing this year, Plymouth North is achieving great lengths. Plymouth North was actually one of the only 15 regular public North high schools to receive the Female Diversity Award in all of Massachusetts this year. Um, National Honor Society also held two inductions for around 70 new members. And alumni Shannon Larson was bylined lead story in the Boston Globe recently. So Plymouth South's art department has been working hard on this project. Um, it's 1,000 cranes that were hung up by students um, through all the different art classes and dis it's displayed in the main lobby. Um, so we have Mrs. Quinn to thank for this collaboration of all the students. And we, she'd also like to extend a thank you to Mr. Corsini, who is a CAD teacher at Plymouth South. Um, the intent is to extend well wishes for the 2020 new, 2021 new year to all students and staff, as well as celebrate our collaborative endurance for navigating the past year. So great job to everyone that who participated. So congrats to the Plymouth North marketing program. They competed in the DECA district competition. Juniors, sophomores, and freshmen are not presented because I don't want to take too much of your time and there was a lot of names. I'm just gonna highlight the senior class who placed um, ranked very high and achieved a lot despite everything going on. So I wanna say Chloe Cronin placed first and Christian Huhulin did as well and tested, had the top test score. Austin Lowood and Nolan Liskoff placed first for Nana Bread and Amber Pastana and Caroline Richards placed as well. So did Kaylee Reardon, Alyssa Brockesby, and Bella Harvey, Maddie Cromwell, and Anthony Zucchini. So we also have a lot of names um, to congratulate the Plymouth South marketing team who recently competed in the DECA district competition. Um, so we have for retail merchandising series, third place, Caitlin Conaway, and second place, Olivia Bogan. Business service marketing, third place to Justin Gates. Entrepreneurship Series, second place to Logan Cantwell. Personal Financial Literacy, fourth place, Noah St. Germain. Business Law and Ethics Team Decision Making, fourth place to Abby Netting and Abby Plord. Sports and Entertainment Team Decision Making, third place to Sam Phillippe and Paige Hayward. Principles of Business Management and Administration was fourth place to Corey Wuja and third place to Timmy Spiegel. Um, and then we also have Principles of Hospitality and Tourism, which was fourth place for Morgan um, Savy, And a top overall scorer of the conference for business and management and administration exam is Abby Netting. Congratulations to everyone. So at North, um, here's a current update on the athletics. Girls hockey won against Situate. Boys hockey lost against Hingham. The swim team is going and they are very successful. Um, they did, however, lost to Hanover, Marshall, and Situate, but they came back with Brockton. Boys basketball won against Duxbury. Um, photos are taken by the yearbook club, who have been working so hard, um, Mariah Chung and Emma George. And also congratulations to Will Buckley, Eagle of the Year, on committing to Westfield State University for track and field and cross country. For sports for South, the winter season is coming to an end. 
and coaches will soon be sharing information regarding Patriots Cup competitions. Fall two sports will be coming up before we know it on February 22nd, which is a modified season. Um, that will be unified basketball, football, cheer, dance, and winter track. And then congratulations to senior Matt Mahoney, who will be honored at a ceremony with his family to sign, to sign a division two letter of intent to play football at Assumption College. So I just wanted to highlight out of everything going on, um, we still have lots of clubs and student activity. We have theater workshops, cl chess club, oh my God, um, SAD and GSA helped by Mr. Cardoso and Ms. Bellino. So last week we had the Lights of Hope for South. Congratulations to Lily Christian, Abby Fitzpatrick and Emma Pollock who managed this event and for all their fantastic work. They worked extremely hard um, through several obstacles, but they made this annual tradition a reality this year. So thank you to the town and the school community for raising $1,855 for Best Israel Deaconess Hospital of Plymouth. And a special thank you to um, Wet Print Today and Log Cabin Bakers for financial support and printing the and luminaries. So great work to the Plymouth South High School marketing team. And lastly, Alex and I just wanna say thank you again. Um, I think we, hopefully we don't sound too tired. Um, you know, in all honesty, we've been students, staff, administration have been adapting, adapting, changing and trying to keep up with the school year. So it's been really challenging, but I think to end off, history has shown us that Courage can be contagious and hope can take on a life of its own by Michelle Obama. So there's a lot, lot more to go and we're just excited to keep doing what we do. So stay safe and stay smart. Awesome. We love your inspirational messages at the, at the end. That's great. Thank you. And congratulations to all of the uh, outstanding achievements by all the students. Does anyone have anything that they want to comment or question our students? No? All right, thank you guys. Oh, oh, sorry, Michelle's writing in the chat. Great job as always. All right, all right, thanks guys. So next, back by popular demand, <laughs> we have our school improvement plans. And we are going to start off with Plymouth North and Mr. Parcelin. Welcome. Thank you very much. I get to go first. That's, you do. That's, that's an honor. <laughs> Back by popular demand. I am not shocked. These are these are high quality school improvement plans. So um, I know Karen, uh, first of all, you guys did a great job. I love the quotes at the end. I'm very impressed. Uh, Karen is also, she mentioned Will Buckley's Eagle of the Year. Karen Fan is also Eagle of the Year as well. So I know she would never give that back to herself. So I thought it's important to mention that. So that's way more important than a school approval plan. So congratulations, Karen. Voted by her peers, which is even better. Um, so uh, I know, Ms. Grimes, you have uh, my um, PowerPoint there. If not, I have it. Um, so uh, obviously, um, Last year, uh, we were supposed to present in March, um, which <laughs> was a little bit uh, unscheduled, I guess, in March is a good word for it. Um, so we are going into year three of our three-year plan. Um, I know that North and South are in different um, phases of our school improvement plan. So uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of uh, kind of past uh, the last year and a half of the uh, school improvement plan. Uh, that we've had. Yes, congratulations, Karen. Uh, well deserved. She's a great kid. Um, so I'm going to go uh, give you a little bit of background on uh, the last few years and then um, give you uh, what we're going to focus on for the next uh, year, really, up until that following March of 2023. So um, the, uh, the work uh, was done by a lot of our uh, school council members. So we have parents. Um, we have a, a lot of new parents this year, which is great. Um, and some ones who've stayed on during my, uh, my now going on third year here. Um, and then we've had some new teachers jump in. So I'm very grateful for the time that they put in. We meet once a month and they give me some really good feedback. Um, so to review, obviously we've had uh, two years or a year and a half of our school improvement plan. The major four goals that we have 
um, are student voice and school culture, um, parent outreach, um, rigor, and to implement and then reflect and uh, improve upon the school based on our NEASC self-study. So all four of those are connected with the, connected the strategic plan um, pretty closely. Uh, each of those four goals matches one, two, three, and four uh, with the main goals that we have for our district that I know we're also working on. So part of what we'll do when we renew our plan in 2022 um, is align our school improvement plan with the new strategic plan goals that I know we're working on uh, as a district. Um, so uh, our big focus in the past school year was voice and collaboration. So based on the feedback I got when I came in as principal, but also over the last two years, um, we've used a lot of that data to not just from the Endicott survey, which was part of our self-study program for NIAS that we're required to do and gave us a lot of really good um, statistical basis for, for our decisions, but also just from um, interviews I had with staff and students and parents. Um, we've implemented a lot of really good kind of low-hanging fruit recognition programs. So if you remember, um, we had the uh, Eagle of the Day program, um, which is we still do, even though it's kind of a, a funky year this year, we're trying to make it work. Uh, we had our Effort February, where teachers nominated students um, for their academic effort. Um, so academic uh, excellence, uh, grit, and uh, teamwork in, in academics all were heralded. And then we coupled those um, with the November shout outs that the kids did for teachers. And if you remember last year, we had um, all of those uh, quotes and pictures along the Main Street hallway for our recognition program. Um, we had the mini lesson program, which was choice. The teachers put together those small lessons during K Block, which was, you know, how to fix a tire or how to uh, make a great burger or something like that. How to, how to run for office was one of them. Um, and the kids got to choose whatever lessons they did. That, those were impl implemented last January, and once everything kind of goes back to normal here, we're gonna hopefully build upon that. Um, and then we sent a lot of kids to leadership programs. So we did uh, a day of service with the seniors that we'll hope, we'll hope to do again this year. Um, we sent delegates to the National Leadership Conference. We had the highest participation ever, uh, Karen can tell you, in the Summer Leadership Conference, just trying to get our kids trained in stuff that will help uh, the building. And so really uh, our goals now are to kind of put a little bit more effort into that voice and culture. So what we really want to do is reach out to all types of kids, um, try and reach out to diverse learners, diverse students of different backgrounds, and make sure uh, that we have formal avenues for that student. Uh, our next goal is, uh, is parent outreach. And so uh, we're trying to refocus away from the kind of the lecture moments of when the teacher, uh, when parents come in. Uh, we've done a lot of stuff in the pack where we're kind of reading at parents. We want to give parents more of an interactive experience um, and also just communicate more. You've probably seen it too. That we've tried to implement the parent pages every week, a couple of weeks. Uh, we try and just use Blackboard a lot more to uh, <clears throat> inform parents uh, about things that are going on. So just kind of low-hanging fruit in the first year and a half on that stuff. But really what we want to do is create more formal scheduled opportunities uh, for parents. and teachers. Our third goal is rigor. Um, the focus really is to help um, give teachers some more strategies to, uh, to integrate into instruction and assessment. So we really spent a lot of time looking at deeper learning and just kind of teaching teachers what that is to try and create mastery and identity and creativity for all uh, students who tried to give them social emotional strategies for students. Um, we've had teachers go into classrooms of other teachers in different departments just to kind of see uh, and observe and use some of the stuff, uh, best practices that they're seeing in different classrooms and then trying to give uh, teachers more ELL, uh, PD and support. Um, very similar to what I've said in the other ones that what we're really trying to do is connect those for all students. So diverse learners, diverse students of different backgrounds um, and have much more data driven um, decision making when it comes to implementing rigor in the building. That's really what we're gonna look at. Um, and then finally, NEASC, which has been uh, a really bright spot in the last two years. Um, you'll remember that they came uh, in October, which feels like a lot longer than October of 2019, but, uh, uh, but it was a year and a half ago that they came. Uh, they gave us 21 commendations in all seven standards uh, and only seven recommendations. They were really good recommendations that I think will really help us um, to move forward and, and really get better um, as a school. Um, two of those are really developing our core values, which you'll see in this year's goals. Um, and then uh, the other is to try and create a curriculum in a common format based on those core values that we're 
So that's kind of a review of uh, 2019 and 2020. And so in 2021, into the end of this cycle, the big, I try and have big keywords for everybody to kind of focus on. It's vision, beliefs, and brand. So the two big uh, action plans on goals one and goals two in student voice and culture, um, we are really trying to formalize student leadership opportunities. So we want to create that Eagle Council where anybody can participate and talk about their experience at North and give ideas on handbook policies or activities we can do. We're just trying to give more types of kids an avenue to have more voice in the, in the building. We're trying to create uh, voice equity and justice programs to, to kind of create more learning opportunities for students in that area. Um, and then uh, also help bring students into the conversation about what our core values are. Um, so all of that will be um, PD for teachers, but also more opportunities for students to participate. And then for parents, it's very similar, trying to bring them into the fold on what our values are as a school, um, what our core beliefs are, and, and into that, and, and you'll probably hear uh, Mrs. Fry say the same thing, because all schools are moving this direction, trying to develop really what our vision for graduates are um, over the next couple of years, um, to communicate that not just to ourselves in every classroom, but to the community um, at large. Um, and then our second two goals um, are, uh, we have rigor and NIA. So in rigor, we are really focusing on data in rigor right now. So um, we are trying to use deeper learning. There's a, a great book um, that's kind of research based on um, trying to create an opportunity where uh, kids have a sense of purpose behind the, the classes and the lessons that they're in, um, and that teachers are providing an opportunity for kids to master the content. They're trying to create uh, an opportunity for kids to identify with the content. So instead of you know, learning biology, they are biologists. They identify with what they're doing in the classroom. Um, and then create with the content. Trying to give them purpose in what we're doing and trying to give, most importantly, it's not easy to do that. Try and give teachers strategies to implement that stuff. So we're really trying to get uh, that deeper learning, which is built on a foundation of growth mindset in the building, which is, which is we're ever trying to push towards an idea where growth mindset, kids are not in a fixed place. They are constantly progressing. Um, and trying to connect that with our instruction um, and also using data. So MCAS, AP, uh, SAT, uh, grade data, attendance data, behavior data, using that panorama um, to its fullest potential in the building, trying to couple actual data to, to really in, to put intent and, and target uh, areas that we need to improve on in instruction in the building. Try and not just say that we're pushing kids harder, but, but do it in a data-driven way that will really show improvement. And then that couples with NEASC, which is uh, their two main goals for us are to develop those core values. So what is it that we want our graduates to be when they walk across that stage? Um, and then also, um, how are we going to do that in a common language in every classroom and, and activity that we do in school? So big goals, uh, and we're going to start to move in that direction over the next year. But the two questions, I think, that encapsulate all of them um, are who what is our vision for who we want our students to become? And I think it's important for parents to have a say in that. It's important for teachers to have a say in that because they are actively doing this in their classrooms every day. It's really important for kids to have an, an, a formal avenue to, to have an input on that as well. And then once we find out what that vision is going to be, um, then we can put that into action with our planning and curriculum and assessment and all of these, these targeted plans to make that vision happen. Um, and communicate that out to parents so they know that uh, that's what we're doing. It's not just grades, it's learning with a big goal at the end. So um, we won't accomplish all this in the next year and a half, uh, but I think the goal is to really set templates up and set plans up so that we can um, use information to, to really see some growth in that. So, um, so that's the plan going forward for the next year and a half. Uh, happy to take any questions. I know um, there's a lot to digest there. So. Okay. That, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, we miss having all the people here. I don't know if we, we would have ever said that before with all <laughs> I the know. presenters. I actually did, yeah. um, does anybody have any questions or comments for Mr. Parcelin? Dr. Sorensen? You, you need to unmute. Mr. Parcelin, I want to say that was a very good presentation. I want to say it was very clear. It was 
uh, enunciated very well, we know where you want to go as a school. And I think that based on what you're sharing with us this evening and other, on other evenings, there's a great many good things happening at Plymouth North High School, no questions asked. Uh, but, what, but, but what really surprises me, and, and perhaps you don't need to answer it this evening, what, per, what surprises me is 46% of the students in the survey were, were either apathetic or not proud of Plymouth North High School. And with all of the, with all of the great things that happen at Plymouth, it surely, it, it, it's astounding to me that so many students either are apathetic or not proud. And I'm hoping that as you go ahead and giving students a voice, we find those students and we, and we sort of find out why that number is so high. That's just, just my observation. Yeah, so that's a, that number stood out to me too. Uh, and so that number came from our Endicott survey back um, in like 2018, 2017. Um, and so that that number popped out right to me, just like it popped out to you. And I, my hope um, is what's what's clear to me when I started in that building, and it's been clear since I since I've been there, is kids just like you mentioned are doing awesome things. They're, the the stuff that's happening in that building, people are are impressed by when I go off into other places and they talk to me about what they've seen. So that, that has not changed from far before I ever got there. Uh, what I think we need to do is make sure everybody knows about it. And I think that kids need to feel like they're being recognized for their efforts. And I think that the community needs to know. And I think there's a lot of work that goes on beyond what I'm doing and beyond, you know, I, I think um, we feel more comfortable hopefully through this work to, to sing those praises, but I think what you, I think what you mentioned is it hit the nail on the head with where we need to really go with this, which is making sure all of our kids feel that, um, especially that percentage in that 46 that may not be as connected to school, which happens in every school across the country. Uh, but our work is really going to be about trying to make sure that we're finding out who those kids are, because sometimes they are wallflowers and they hold back a little bit, um, and making sure that they have a place in the building too. And that's really important. So Excellent. I'm glad you found that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Haywood. Um, you know, I, uh, I'd like to hear what Karen has to say before I. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so going off on that, that's actually a really great point, um, Dr. Sorensen, because I think sometimes students, I can say for most, find it hard to identify themselves and really feel I don't know, I wouldn't say special, but in a way like heard. So I think that's something that we've seen more. I think we're more outspoken in my classes. So I think it's a great start, but it's a noticeable number. And I think that we need to really address that before we can address anything else really, that our students are the one that feel this way when it should be about them, you know, so. Yeah, Ms. Haywood. Um, um, aside from, uh, I guess, having a voice, what what else do you think those numbers are stemming from? Um, I, I was that directed to me. I think so, right? Yeah. So I, I think it's a whole host of things, to be really honest with you. I, and I think it is stuff that might be um, connected, maybe to the culture at North, right? I think it also is where kids are today. Um, and I think that we are, um, and any parent on here can tell you, um, kids find it more difficult to interact sometimes. Um, and they, and well, I, and I mentioned it in the, the improvement plan and it, and you see it everywhere and Karen kind of encapsulated it perfectly. Um, kids just need an opportunity to feel a part of what we do. And so a lot of and I mentioned the low hanging fruit of the last year and a half, a lot of the rah-rah, sis boom ba, eagle of the day stuff that we've been doing is to try and make everybody feel like there's a sense of community there. Um, but I think that we need to make sure that we are using actual data, not just talking about it, but using actual data to find out um, who is still out there. Um, and I think it's academics that's important um, to, to have like a growth mindset about kids so that uh, we're not typecasting kids in classrooms. I also think it, it is, you know, a social emotional thing. I think we need to, to educate teachers 
about how to interact. And I think it's all teachers today. We came from a different era of, of the way kids feel about things and express themselves. I think we need to do work on that. And we've started that, but it's gonna take a long time. Um, and I think we need to look at, at students of all sorts of diverse backgrounds and have our staff be really educated about how to, to be aware of that. And I think that it's a whole host of things, but I think it comes from an idea of those two questions. I think it comes from really a base of, you know, how are we always looking at kids progressing instead of where they are right now? And I, and I think that when you see every kid as a, as a canvas that you can help turn into an amazing painting or something to that effect, you know, that I think is really what's going to help the school grow is if we're looking at everybody right now. And that's comes with strategies of work and data and all sorts of thinking to move. But I think that if we're all pushing that direction, hopefully we'll get there. But great points. Thank you for your answer. Anybody else have anything? Ms. Badger? Mine is more like, I think an anti, it's not, you can't be, we can't qualify it because, you know, I'm looking at the data and when I, it was also kind of something that I was like, wow, that's, that's a, that's a really, I don't know, it's not super low. I mean, it could always be lower, right? That 54%, we don't want it to be any lower, but I'm curious, Karen, not to put you on the spot, if you feel that over time, things maybe have, because this is 2017 and we're now in 2021, have you seen improvement over your time at, at North? Um, I definitely have, I for sure. I mean, I, um, the old person, principal was there my freshman year and then Parcelin came in right in sophomore year. I know I had a rocky sophomore year. I think everyone did. But um, then we went into like this really big, like all these announcements, all of this like spotlight, stuff like that. So it highlighted everyone and it really made us kind of like work harder maybe to like be acknowledged. So I think in a way it helped, but um, we're improving, I think, in a sense. I see it, but I think um, there's still room to grow for sure. A lot of room, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Ms. Bridges, um, did I see you were going to speak? Did you have a question or comment? No, okay. Anybody else? And I, I agree with everything that, that they said and um, two things that stuck out for me was, you know, the student voice, I remember Years ago when we started with the I-3 grant, like a big chunk of that, we talked about student voice and you know, having kids be a part of the decision-making and all that. So I'm really excited to see that. And even though for some reason, rigor is like my least favorite word in the, world, in the universe, I liked your section. I think it just sounds like a scary word, but I liked what you said about making this relevant and making it more meaningful to the students because I, I even know with my own kids that, you know, and, and this is what we say, I think, with the tech programs is when it's relevant and they're involved and it means something in their life, then they're going to want to um, pay more attention to that, even when I was younger. I, so I really, those are the two things that really stood out to me. So thank you. All Thanks. right. Anybody else? We're good? All right. Thank you so much. It's good to see thank you. you. Yeah, you too. And next, we're going to move on to Plymouth South High School. Hey. <laughs> and Mrs. Fry. Okay. Um, I think Ms. Grimes is going to share the screen as well. But good to see everyone. I've missed you all. So um, I only get to talk to Mr. Chofi about human resources once in a while, not all of you. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but I, I can't believe Mr. Parsons in his third year. I feel old. But it's been a pleasure working alongside him in the short time since I've been back at South, so. All right. All right. Um, so just to start off, obviously, um, it's great to be here tonight. And again, I'm not the the artist or the visual person and Emily Goonan is, but some of the pictures throughout this do have a little message, so I may highlight that as well. But um, our school council, we're in a very different place than Mr. Parslin, um, purely because it's the first year of a, of a plan. So um, my job tonight is just to outline the goals and things of that nature. And we've been meeting with the group who is fantastic. They were in place last year, so they have a great perspective on things as well. 
Um, so it's a wonderful group. And I always say the highlight of school council for me is the students. And that visual is the from the Lights of Hope that um, Alex just talked about, which was just, it, uh, you all probably remember it from the grist mill. And I was worried it wouldn't have the same magic and it really did. Um, I'm a big believer about relationships and communication and to see our kids come together in the community drive through. We have a staff member struggling with cancer right now and the, the girls raised so much money through creative measures and QR codes. It was just awesome. So I just wanted to give them a shout out um, for that. But this is our group and our members. Um, for our school improvement plan, um, as I said, we are creating a three-year plan. And what I've been able to try to do in the short time I've been back at South, I really kind of took back over in September. In the summer, I was kind of doing both jobs, and that's usually a time when you can get a lot of data collected. Um, but obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic as well. So what we've done is we've assessed a lot of the stakeholders um, the kids really through their teachers at this point, starting after February vacation, we're going to be doing just a Plymouth South based survey on a number of the goals that are outlined. But I did spend a lot of time with the survey that Cheryl Delory, our social emotional coach, um, put together for parents and students and staff and was able to call a lot of data. And I've had a lot of informal conversations. The hardest part about coming back to Plymouth South for me has been I've been gone for four years. And people know the sound of my voice, but they don't know what I look like. So in HR, in my loud voice, in HR, a lot of it is behind the scenes and working with the adults. Um, if I see parents at the supermarket or so, they'll say they know my voice, but I'm really trying to encourage them to get involved in the conversation because in these times, it's hard to get to know my kids with a mask on. But we're trying all these creative measures to you know, build those relationships, even with our distancing efforts and things of that nature. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, and I'll go to the next slide as we've shared all this with our school council. Um, so you heard Mr. Parslin talk. I, I happen to love NEASC. I'm a little bit of a NEASC groupie. And what happened, you know, 10 years ago is we designed a core values and beliefs. And we did a really creative, neat process. Some of you may remember we called it, what do we want in our backpack? What do we want our kids to be in the future? And this is something that what NEASC has done as an organization is really turned it around and say the vision of the graduate, which I like better. And these Panther TV kids on the roof of South High School last year's class, they were just the incredible children who went off and have maximized all different parts of their education. And so to me, these kids from all different walks are a vision of our graduates and what we want beyond high school. Uh, what we've done is we started just in, in the actual school improvement plan, there's a lot more logistics and action plan, but we did a school-wide activity with the faculty through a few in services to get their input on what are our kids you know, going to be needing in the future. And I will tell you, if we did this activity a year ago, whatever, say September of last year, I don't even know what day of the week it is anymore. Um, I think we would have got a lot of different answers. But I, what I was so proud of the faculty was that we really looked at it as COVID times as well. Because as we all know, a lot of things are going to change when this is all over. Hopefully for the better, we'll learn lessons. And I think some things will stay. We regularly have that conversation at the high school, like what are the good things that have come out of this difficult situation that will stay and help our students and our families in the community. So we have, I'm gonna to get to the list in a minute, but we've in the final stages. We're now involving the students in this discussion and we're gonna share it out with the parents as well, but we went through the staff. If you look here, this activity, um, back in my day, what we did, it sounds really corny, but I'm really into getting the buy-in for these types of things. And we took pictures of textbooks and a phone that was on the wall. And the staff had discussions. They really had a fun time saying, back in my day, and now what do we think it'll be 10 years from now? And it was a really cool activity because they were able to say, they looked at it again with this COVID lens of communication, Zoom, Google Meet culture, things that some of our teachers cannot believe the things they're able to do that they didn't think they would. And this photograph to the right of the biomed kids. And I remember I was fortunate when it started working with Ms. Reardon and um, Dr. Campbell at the time and all that. And to see the growth of this program, I start crying all the time, ask Chris. So I see these kids and the opportunities that have abounded. And 10 years ago, this didn't exist to the level it is now. When you go to these to the biomed celebration, all the kids are pursuing 
careers of this nature. So it's just, it's something that when we did our core values and belief work 10 years ago, we talked about what's in my backpack. We taught, we read the book as a faculty, this I believe, and we really took the belief system. So I feel like now NIES kind of has their act together even more and we're saying, okay, now what is our vision for the graduate? So it's kind of the fun stage and we needed a fun activity with the teachers to get everyone in a good mood. So this was something we did. These were the guiding questions. I'm a big believer in the questions that lead the dialogue are critical. And we said, really, what themes stand out to your group as what do you think the kids need? How could these identities of a graduate reflect our ideals and shape our vision moving forward? Is there anything missing that you'd like to add? And we showed the old video that we did 10 years ago. So it was a lot of fun. And then how will COVID change our approaches to the development of our students? We're all very conscious of the social emotional needs. And if we don't appreciate this, then this is the number one thing moving forward in any graduate that comes out of Plymouth South High School, kind of the total package. Um, we'll got, make some questions for the kids with that same piece. So for the faculty side, again, we started this in October of this year. These are really the big, um, the themes that have come out of all the work they've done. Um, and I think the interesting ones that jumped out at me were effective communicator across any medium or audience. Even three years ago, I don't think the final part of that would have come out. Um, there is a typo at the bottom. It's supposed to be resiliency and ability to overcome adversity not diversity, but resiliency has come up over and over again. And that's always been something that we want in our high school kids. But I think more than ever, we know that the resiliency is what's going to get them through difficult times. And we've seen that firsthand right now. The global learner, anti-bias and equity, I'll hear about in another goal, but that is something that is paramount. And we just have to make sure we make it come alive in our hallways. And you folks can read, but these even to me, who has been a high school principal for a very long time, what came out were very different from different audiences. And I think that is a sign of our times as well. So that's kind of where we stand right now. Um, so that's our first goal. And we're again, we're in the beginning stages, but then we'll kind of hopefully formalize it next year. And one final thing I forgot to add is that the number one piece of that is um, really saying, okay, how is it tangible? We now have all these wonderful words that we want to make sure Alex Godfrey and Karen Fan become when they leave high school, but what makes it real and what makes it come alive? And the faculty knows we're going to really narrow it down to probably six or seven because we want it to be accountable and accessible and something that, that we can see and breathe and not just put it on a poster on a wall. That's important to us. Um, the second goal is really, we are our advisory program, I have a lot of um, ownership in and it's something that we put together again 10 years ago when we were having some major culture issues in our building and it's funny this is the purpose that was designed by a team of teachers and students and parents 10 years ago and i think it, the funny part is i still think the purpose is great um my son needs to go away sorry <laughs> he just looked at that was my cooper um so the advisory statement of purpose is if you read it small supportive environment more than ever i think the kids need a, a space that they feel completely safe to connect about things that aren't necessarily english math social studies and science again over to the picture this was created this year by our human behaviors class which is a co-taught class for students with autism and regular ed students and I don't know if you've been to different amusement parks before COVID and we've designed a logo for an inclusive environment and making safe spaces in our school for all types of students and learners. So that's something that we wanna even develop further through advisory. So while the purpose is in a great place, the curriculum is not. So um, the, the next two slides just show topics of curriculum and Chris will remember when this curriculum was developed, we sent it all over the country as a model. It was selected as one, but the topics that were grade level specific because the kids follow their advisor through the four years, but we have a team of teachers working right now to redesign this and say, okay, what are the new main content areas? And one thing you'll see in my school improvement plan, um, in some of the data in that survey I mentioned from um, Cheryl Delory, one of our slides said um, it was a connection with adults. And it, it said in the data that 75 out of 500 students at Plymouth South High School did not feel they had a strong connection with a, a, an adult and they wanted to talk to an adult. So what this team already did is we identified those 75 individuals and we have ensured that a, 
a safe faculty member has reached out to those people. So that was just one piece we put into play. But what we I would like to do further is when we conduct an activity on the connectedness, kind of like what Mr. Parson was talking about, is we drill down to get the data and then make sure those students are identified with a safe adult to discuss things with. And I think in these times it's more difficult than ever, but in the same breath, it's more important than ever as well. So the curriculum we're working to redesign um, in these two areas. Um, the third goal, I asked Mrs. Grimes to go to the next slide, is um, family and community engagement. As I said, my loud voice people here, but they don't, the, the not having people in a building, I'm missing a great deal as a principal, um, having no, been a principal for so long and knowing the culture and community and getting to know parents over the years by seeing them at the play or a game, that's really hard. And um, I think our families miss that as well. So we have really believe in strong, strong communication and relationships. Um, without that, we can't do anything. And I think, again, and I hate to talk about COVID as much as I am, but I think with COVID, we've learned that communication is more paramount than ever. So we're doing um, regular emails through Aspen, Panther pages. I'm not as crafty as Mr. Parcelin. I don't have Peter Parcelin's pages, dear God. So I went to Panther's pages. Um, but our social media, we've really tried to have a very positive presence. I know a lot of you follow it and sharing the good news. Um, one of our students we partnered with, um, Ms. Romboldi to do an Instagram, which is fantastic. So the kids follow Instagram, the parents follow Facebook, some people just email. So instead of just picking one, we're really trying to canvas it all. And um, the final thing on this is we've worked very hard at Plymouth South this year to maintain ceremonies and events that matter to our kids. It's very easy to just do a Zoom um, production. And it's not easy, I shouldn't say that, <laughs> but it's easier. We have pushed the envelope to still maintain we brought back last year's underclassmen awards for the book awards. We're doing in-person information nights where instead of an eighth grade orientation where we talk at people, we're doing an active video and then having sign up nights with myself and the freshman assistant principal so that that personal connection as well as the follow up. These are things that I've been a principal for too many years to count and we still can get better at communication and strong relationships. And I say regularly, I make a point to call people instead of just email because it's so confusing even when you're explaining contact tracing and all the things we talk about all the time, a quick phone call solves it much more than three emails. So it may sound like a minor goal. And then back to my picture, I'm very excited about the pictures. I didn't take any of them either. That This is our new swim team. and. The relationship is I actually went tried Peter knows this I tried to go to the meet last Friday I was locked out I'm married to the athletic director I can't even get into the swim meet so <laughs> so but these kids in this swim program what you folks approved last year is just we have I think 30 kids between the two of us on the team and they are loving it and they're doing dry land practices and those relationships it's another way for some to have a connection to the high schools in our community because of this opportunity. So they can't have this, they can't have people come in. I wasn't even allowed in. I was gonna knock on the windows. I didn't wanna get in trouble. But um, in all honesty, they're, they're having virtual swim meets, but they're going every day, they're practicing. So it's it's something that connection and family and community and the, the Plymouth community has supported it. Cause I've, I've said a lot, our girls hockey and our gymnastics and our swim are some of my favorite sports. Cause you just hear go Plymouth. It's not, you know, all the others. So the we're really, this is something I think we will continue, obviously, over the next three years with some more tangible goals, but that's where we've started this year. Um, our final kind of goal slide is something we're calling Allies for Equity. It's much more verbose in the school improvement plan. Um, I did a staff survey when I came back and over 50% of the staff shared a definite need for school-wide diversity work. We've developed a subcommittee over the past month and a half. We were focused on the vision and now we want the vision of the graduate to, to really help us with this work. It's very important. We're involving stakeholders, identifying needs, developing programs and opportunities. And, and I don't want to determine the action plan with just the school council because that's one group that one kind of tentacle of the Plymouth South community, but I really think we need to have a much bigger look. And this is where we hope to go for the future. And our, our student singers who, it breaks my heart that they can't sing in a building, but you see them out there working at all hours of the night, even in the cold weather, you know, because they can sing outside. So I think we have to look at things differently. And I'm really gonna charge this group, which I'm calling Allies for Equity, of how do we make 
our diversity needs and awareness come alive at Plymouth South High School. And all we have a lot of people already um, invested in being a part of that process. So that's the next, we have a meeting in March. So coming up on that. Um, and then the final slide, um, as I shared, those are our main four goals. They align with the district strategic plan and the my goals as a principal, which has always been our guidance. Um, and this slide is something that um, what I started with in saying what will remain after COVID. And I think there's some incredible things that have come out. I think the kindness, you'll see that picture. Our kids have done two different kindness projects and they initiate this. This isn't a teacher saying we want to do things like this. Our staff members of the month, the first two months were the nurses and the calf ladies. And one thing, um, Peter knows at North, and I'm sure Alex and Karen, the food is free. This could be the greatest thing that has happened in a high school in, since I became a principal in 2000, whenever, too. I'm much older than Mr. Parslin. Um, the kids are eating breakfast for the first time because they, they get there at 7 in the morning. We, we begin our days at 6.30 in the morning. And watching them the, with the calf ladies grab the food, eat breakfast, and they're better for the day. I mean... It's unbelievable, and I know it probably won't stay, but I like to be visionary and excited, but it sounds like a minor thing, but that, this is a picture of Miss Nugent and a student. We brought our award ceremony into the classroom to recognize the kids in front of their peers, and then we sent a video to their parents. So I think the thinking outside the box is really been kind of neat, and it's not linked to this plan, but I think that moving forward, relationships and communication are the number one thing. And I have said all along in COVID, um, go slow to go fast and people matter. And I think that's the real message between each one of those four goals and where we go in future years. So I apologize for talking so fast, but. <laughs> no, you did great and we miss you as well. So <laughs> anybody have any questions or comments for um, Ms. Fry and Plymouth South High School's program? No, I just want to say that um, I, I think it's really important about the um, resiliency and overcoming diversity. And I'm so glad that it's a big focus there. It's, uh, it's really an important thing now. It's probably always been important, but it's brought this COVID thing has brought it to, to mind more. And um, so to me, it's, it's really, really important and uh, everyone needs a, an equal shake. And uh, so, and, and I'm, I'm grateful too that you were um, talking about communicating with the parents more and how difficult it is actually now with masks because they don't even know who you are. <laughs> it's very difficult. So, but to build the relationships and, and, and do what you're doing, I think it's great. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Badger and then Ms. Haywood. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again for that wonderful presentation and thank you for um, explaining the 70 or I should say um, talking about the 75 out of 500 kids. I think that is what really caught me when I was reading through it. Um, and, and then it makes me think about who are those students who didn't think that they, you know, maybe they're like, ah, who cares? And they, you know, yes, I do have a connection or maybe their connection isn't strong. So thank you for talking about that because I think, um, what you've always done at the high school and you know when you were there before is that the relationships and making people a part of the community I think is so important so thank you for answering the question before I could even ask it <laughs> yeah, they're, they're in a tough the kids I feel for it. it's it's hard it's really really hard right now so yeah great okay Miss Haywood and then Dr. Sorensen um I also want to echo um, what was said by Ms. Burgess and Ms. Um, Badger. What a wonderful presentation. I am um, actually glad about some of the action goals that have been included. And I'm glad that, you know, the staff has had like this insight as to truly what the needs are. Um, and, and obviously, first and foremost, always the, the students um, as well. Um, and, um, and they're such an integral part. I, I think with even some of the activities that we do at No Place for Hate, I, I, I we always go to like, this, we go to our like youth, um, you know, representatives because their insight is mm -hmm. amazing. So um, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Great. Dr. Sorensen. Um, Ms. Freya, I agree. I agree with everything everybody said. A very good, precise, excellent presentation. A lot of great information. I want to say that I know for probably uh, four or five, maybe even six years, Plymouth South High School has had a goal 
to identify, and now we're calling them the 75, but to identify students who sort of come to school, who are sort of not connected with anybody and just go through the motions. And we've been doing that for a while and I'm glad we're still doing it, don't get me wrong. But is there any way to, to measure that? We've been doing it for a while. Can, can we have pre and, pre and post measure of attendance or grades or something for that 75 to see if it's working? We did years, I'm dating myself, Dr. Sorry, when you were on my school council, we did measure it years ago. We, we took, um, what was the tool with the Department of Ed? We took, there was, I forget the name of it, Chris, you might remember, do you remember the name of it? We, we did that and we saw growth, um, but we will definitely do that with E75 because we took this as, we, like I shouldn't call it the COVID-75, but only 500 students took the survey and there's over a thousand kids in the school. So it's something that these 75, I have the guidance counselors and the adjustment counselor kind of tracking their progress and saying, where were we in some of the 75 when we met, when, I, when some of the people met with them said, no, I'm good, I just clicked that off. But they actually said, I'm worried about my friend. So they said, you know, I'm doing okay. I just kind of checked that off, but I'm worried about my friend, Stacy. And so the list grew to bigger than 75, if that makes sense. But we are going to try to to follow through with that on seeing how we end up with them and things of that nature. Because we yeah, need I to. Would, I would be eager to hear those results. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. Anyone else have anything? No, and I echo what everybody said. I, the one thing that I was, I was kind of laughing and not laughing because it really isn't <laughs> funny. The 10 year project. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we're talking about 10 years from now, but think about it. A year from today, we had no idea. No idea. Mm -hmm. No idea. <laughs> yeah. So it's like the 11 month project, you know, like it's, it's, it's so hard to wrap our head around that we weren't even having these discussions then. So I think it'll be interesting to see how that yeah. turns out. So thank you. Oh, Ms. Haywood, I'm sorry. Did you have another comment? I, I wanted to just ask Alex, um, what is your, um, you know, uh, a perception or a idea regarding the um, the plan coming from your from your high school. Hmm. Good. So I definitely think that, like as Karen had said earlier, there's a lot of work to do in the schools. But mm -hmm. I think that I know that Mrs. Fry has been really good about like making connections with the students. It's been like one of her things that she's focused on a lot since she came here. And so I think we're definitely headed in the right direction on making sure that everyone's getting the help that they need if they need any or that everyone's feeling included. But I think that there needs to be maybe more like education on like the staff members on that. Um, but just because like we want to be able to reach as many students as we can. And I, and I think Alex makes a great point. And I think next year is going to be critical. Like this year is important that we're following our like guidelines, but how we recover is yeah. paramount in my mind with the staff. Um, and I'm not just talking about academics. Kids are resilient. I mean, I know that, but we're gonna have to do some real intentional work with those 75 kids and beyond. And I think really kind of an end of school year look this year and use that data for September is really critical with our populations. Um, and I think this senior class, I have a real soft spot for because they've had it way worse than the class of 2020. Um, and so we're gonna try, we're, we're doing, coming up with some crazy, we're doing a red carpet for superlatives video. Like we're coming up with crazy ideas. We're gonna do something with a prom, even if they can't dance. But those are things that we are committed to doing because it, it's been tough, but I think they will, they will do incredible things, but it's, uh, they're really, and, and the staff, I can't say enough about from the, the custodians to the teachers, to the administrators who are spraying desks and cleaning them every lunch. And it's, it's a team effort from the top down, so. We appreciate it. Great, thank you. Anybody I else? try to get into the swim meet this Friday again. So tell us, <laughs> maybe they'll unlock the doors for me. I tell Mr. Fry. <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right. Oh, Miss Burgess. Yeah, I just wanted to say on on the resiliency. You you said that uh, you know kids are resilient. They are, but there are those who aren't. Correct. And uh, yeah. I mean, there's less of them, but. They're very important, and it's very important that we, you know, find out who and, and work on that for them, because mm -hmm. they they need that for their life too. But mm -hmm. this um, this COVID has uh, changed yeah. in, uh, perspectives for people all the way around. In some mm -hmm. ways, it's good because um, many of these these kids have grown up in a time when there wasn't any diversity. Like I grew mm -hmm. up with the Second World War and the and the um, what do you call it? 
when we, nobody had anything, but but the you know, stock market crash. But anyway, I grew up in so I had some something you know to go on to to be resilient about. I had some practice at that, but many of these don't. So uh, what what they have, they have. But in in some cases, kids have more problems than just this. Yeah. They also have big, big other problems that we are not aware of. And those are the kids that worry me. Yeah. And, yeah, and now Margie, it's a great, but our big thing is now the how, like how we get there to get these yeah. goals achieved. I'm at the early stage, you know, it's how do we make it happen? And I think things that we will learn from COVID and some great things, but I, I need, I want team meetings back in a building because you can connect with a family in person better than on Zoom. So I, that personal, I'm a little obsessed with communication as some of you know, and I think <laughs> I want our kids to have strong communication skills and the soft skills because that's gonna get them in life very, very far as well, so. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you very much. Um, all right, so now we're gonna go, uh, just double check, is everybody, I think everybody's commented, correct? Um, we're going to go to our COVID and our preparedness update with Dr. Campbell. Thank you very much. And thank you, Pete and Patty, for this evening. Thank really you. really appreciate it. I think, you, I think as they've said and highlighted that relationships is really the most important thing. Uh, our staff, our families, and our students, um, first and foremost, and everything that we do really needs to center around that. And another thing that they said is really, you know, using data, using actual information, not making assumptions that we think things are going well when we don't know for sure. So I think um, in both cases, at both high schools, we have some great things going on uh, that will support that work moving forward. And, and um, so I'm really excited about that. So I'm gonna give a, a brief uh, update regarding uh, any COVID situations. So this past week, as we report uh, weekly on Fridays to our COVID dashboard, uh, we had 16 confirmed cases for students, 96 students quarantined, six staff confirmed with COVID and 11 that were currently quarantined. So our confirmed student cases and quarantines were actually lower than they've been since the week ending December 11th, which is a good sign and staff numbers are the best that they've been since before the holiday break. So we're happy to see this trend. Um, so um, I'd like to take a moment also to discuss COVID surveillance testing, which we've had conversations about. So as you know, we recently sent out a survey to our Plymouth community, our staff and to our families to gauge interest in uh, participating in a COVID test opportunity. We were originally looking at um, COVID pool testing uh, so, but we were exploring another option to give individual PCR testing to both staff and students as an opportunity. So uh, after considerable interest was expressed through the survey, we've obtained individual PCR tests for our district. These tests are secure, confidential, no cost COVID-19 surveillance testing options for district staff and students to again, participate in if they choose. Um, and really, I think another way of just assuring our commitment to really optimizing the health and safety of our school community while you know, trying to maintain safe in school learning for our students. So this specific test that we're moving forward with is a PCR test, like I said, which will ob obviously require individual consent and authorization. So we'll work on uh, that process in the near future. It is a molecular test. It is most highly accurate, uh, does not need to be repeated as the COVID pool testing would have. Um, it utilizes an individual saliva, so it's the most non-invasive in a diagnosis active coronavirus infection, and the results will be provided within 24 to 36 hours, so it will be very timely as well. So the purpose of this testing initiative is to offer our school community, again, an option for convenient randomized surveillance, surveillance testing during the remainder of the school year, uh, as well as a um, prior to returning home from, uh, or school, I should say, um, from a week long break during the months of February and April. So uh, we, we, we were really excited about giving this opportunity to our families and to our staff. You know, in addition, we're hoping to include the testing option during other times, such as when a member of our school community is deemed a close contact. So it'll give us an opportunity to utilize 
these kits as well. So um, as we're hoping to get this new initiative in place very soon, we'll be sending families and staff commission slips, as I said, uh, and authorizations, which will communicate our rollout plan very soon uh, for participating once we identify all the participants. So I just, I brought a kit to show you. So you can see this is an individual kit that people will receive. Uh, and when you open up the package, much like getting a package in the mail from Amazon, we we'll have individual instructions, very simple to use, um, showing you how to register your kit. It's a saliva-based um, test, as I said, and you follow the simple directions. You put it in the self-addressed uh, postage for FedEx, and that information will be sent um, if we if someone sends it by 3 p.m. Uh, West Coast time, they get it next morning and um, guarantee it 24 to 36 hours from then. So we're really excited about that. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, vaccines and vaccinations. So as you all know, um, all educators are scheduled in phase two of the Massachusetts vaccine plan, which and officially started today. And our hope is that our employees will have, um, you know, have an option to receive that as soon as possible between the months of February and April when they're scheduled to do so. Uh, the state prioritizes the order of vaccine distribution. So we have no authority or control over this, but we continue to work with public health and any other agencies that we can to try to seek this opportunity for our staff to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, mo most recently, last week, I believe it was on the 28th, uh, the South Shore Superintendents Roundtable of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, along with many union presidents, our, our own included, uh, wrote to the governor um, as a unified group uh, joining an effort to uh, respectfully request to um, really try to prioritize our educators and make them eligible as soon as possible for vaccinations. Uh, and we understand that the state supply has been very low uh, to make its way to Massachusetts, but we're doing everything we can really as a, as a group to urge the importance of providing the vaccine to our educators. So in our letter to the governor, we cited the, the guidance of the CDC urging the governor to prioritize the health and well-being of our educators um, so that we can fully operate um, at, at, you know, at the greatest uh, level for our schools. We, um, while we understand that the supply, again, is an issue currently, we believe that vaccination of educators should be a priority and, um, you know, brought attention to the governor. Some states that have, have really figured out how to do this already, including New York, Connecticut, Maine, um, uh, and Virginia that have classified educators in that first phase of the vaccine. Um, having said that, I am happy to report that our school nurses were included within phase one. Uh, with first responders. So our nurses are cl uh, clearly, as we know, the most at risk for exposure to any illness. And, and given the nature of their jobs, I'm very happy that all of our, edu uh, excuse me, all of our nurse educators uh, and health office workers that wanted to receive the vaccine were able to do so at this point. So we will continue to do everything we can to expedite the availability of vaccine and, and to advocate for our staff. Um, if we're able to get the vaccine um, regionalized in the schools as an opportunity, we certainly would be open to that. Um, and we'll work with any state officials and our local public health officials certainly to do that. Um, lastly, related to uh, a COVID update, next Monday, February 8th, we'll have our next community health advisory team meeting, um, hoping that we may use our time together, not only to discuss how we may continue to evaluate our practices this year, but get some collective feedback as what measures we need to take to consider our eventual full return to school, whenever that may be, um, certainly uh, by next fall uh, at, at the least. So that's all I have, uh, Ms. Savory, for the COVID update. And I'm happy to take any questions on that before going to the general update. Any questions for Dr. Campbell? Okay. Um, I had one, but it just left my brain. So I'll come up with it afterwards. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, Miss Badger has one. 
I did. Sorry. I knew I had one, but it, like you, it had left me. Um, I, my question goes back to the vac, uh, the COVID testing. Do we have a, like a ceiling on how many we're going to be able to do and fit in budgetarily? We're using COVID grant funds to do this. And I have um, 1,800 that were delivered today. Okay. Another 700 that will be delivered tomorrow. So we'll have 2,500 on hand uh, by tomorrow. Um, it's just a matter of it getting them. We made the order on Friday and they came this morning by 930. So um, I, I don't think it will be an issue in terms of supply. Um, and again, we're using, we will dedicate COVID grant funds to do this. Thank and we you. had a very, a very strong, um, overwhelming response from both families and staff in terms of voluntary uh, participation. Thank you. And I, um, if nobody has anything else, I remembered what I was going to say. I wanted to actually thank you because I know that since um, I know a couple of weeks ago we talked about it, but you've had some meetings with the teachers. And um, I know you had a second one, and I've had a lot of positive feedback, especially on the second one. Yeah. So I just wanted to thank you for, for doing that. And I think that it, it's, it's really important to keep that communication and transparency up. And that's pretty much the feedback that I've gotten. So thank you for doing that. Sure. Yeah, of course. And, and, and you know, the times t tend to vary. We're trying to trying to fit them in um, as many po possible opportunities as well as, you know, meeting with people face to face when we're in the schools. As I've said before, I'm in buildings every day. So really having an opportunity to have one on one conversations with, is, is great with people as well. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, you for that. Yeah, Miss Badger, did you have Sorry, something? I, I remembered my other one. <laughs> and will this also um, cover our bus drivers as well? Like if they have a student that rides their bus that may have been positive or they have a concern that they might have it? It would cover our, our, our employees and okay. our students. But not the bus drivers and that would be over with our students. students. The, the drivers uh, work or, you know, their, their employees are first student. Yeah. Okay. Someone was asking me that. All right. If we don't have any other questions, we'll move on to reports and proposals from the superintendent. Okay. Back to you. Thank you. So I just want to welcome uh, Mr. Brad Brothers as he officially starts his first day with us today. Um, Brad has been in many days already uh, transitioning with Mr. Costin, but we welcome him now as our official school business administrator. So welcome, Brad. Um, the, the, poor, the poor man had some uh, computer issues first thing this morning, but I think they've been worked out. I think the tech staff helped him. Um, I would first like to address the decision to notify families last night about um, doing an early dismissal today. We haven't received a lot of questions about this. We had some um, as it's raining outside, but um, as many people know from all accounts and reports that my office receives and received, we were receiving information from the National Web Weather Service Bureau as well as many other sources, which we, we, which we do on a regular basis, which led us to believe that the timing of this winter storm, which really hasn't uh, arrived here in Plymouth, but the, the, the timing of the storm was uh, going to be particularly treacherous um, at our typical dismissal time. So we had a lot of conversation last night about the information, which at that point was considered very reliable. Um, but as we know, you know, a, a degree or two can really make a difference, speci specifically on a coastal community like Plymouth. Um, given the fact that we have hundreds of high need students that attend schools on remote Mondays, um, coupled with the fact that we have staff in schools that support these students, as well as students that are remote, we made the decision to do an early dismissal at all levels so that students and staff that were in our buildings, which includes um, all of our teachers, would get home safely. So we were really concerned about, as I said, uh, the information that we had led us to believe that we would have considerable treacherous, heavy, wet snow starting the fall around one o'clock and, and really getting heavy around two and three. So really looking at, you know, um, young drivers as well as our elementary bus runs and are our, our, um, really just concerned about the safety and well-being of our students. So 
We realized that the call was late last night, but thought that it was still more important to get the word out last night as opposed to at 540 in the morning, which you typically would do in the case so that families who had children, particularly those that were going to school could make arrangements if they needed to. So I just wanted to spend a moment to, to explain that. Um, I also want to take a moment to recognize our middle school science teachers. So as Mrs. Reardon has mentioned uh, the last time that she provided a program update to the school committee, uh, our science technology instructional focus in the district right now is on the development of a phenomena-based instruction. Um, really looking at you know, a, an approach I think that Mr. Parson was talking about in terms of a, a, a deeper learning approach, really using phenomena in their daily lives to make those connections. Uh, for the past two years, our middle school teachers have taken part in significant training and professional development with the rollout of our open SIED curriculum. Um, through Allison's leadership, Mrs. Reardon's leadership, we are helping staff determine their role in, in leading this type of instruction. So this focus is in alignment with the direction that the, the Department of Ed has proposed for science-based instruction on research from uh, a number of organizations like the National Science Foundation, the Institute for Science and Math Education, Achieve, the American Academy of the Advancement of Science, uh, as well as the National Academy of Science. So as the committee knows, uh, I've made a point of visiting our schools and conducting walkthroughs on a regular basis with principals and coordinators um, weekly uh, since the beginning of the year. So um, while I've been so impressed with our entire staff who really uh, the amazing creativity and dedication that they've shown during this hybrid model. I just wanted to take an opportunity this evening to highlight our middle school science teachers for continuing with this really truly engaging program without missing a beat. You know, I had the opportunity to walk through classrooms at PCIS with Mrs. Reardon in October and again with both Mrs. Reardon and Mr. Murphy last week. Um, and in order to implement this type of program and this teaching, our teachers are prepping so many more materials for student investigation as they can't share any materials as they typically would. So I'm just so impressed and so appreciative for you know, their unwavering commitment. So I just wanted to take a moment this evening to, to recognize them specifically. Uh, related, you may recall uh, conversations that we've had in the past about the Mayflower Autonomous Ship but the, the, the Mars Project, yeah. um, this is a connection with, um, you know, it's named after the 1620 Mayflower, you know, in the Mayflower <laughs> Voyage. Um, in my work with Plymouth 400 and our partners in the UK, I first became aware of this project before any funding or partners were identified about five, six years ago. Uh, so this idea is now, has now become a reality. So the um, Mayflower Autonomous Ship is a highly innovative project which is to design, build, and sail the first full-sized, fully autonomous unmanned ship across the Atlantic Ocean. So the sailing of this ship is scheduled to take place on President's Day, April 19th, and it's gonna make its way eventually to Plymouth, Massachusetts. So it's um, over 100 feet in length um, and this autonomous research ship uh, will be powered by wind and solar technology. And this vessel will carry on board with it a variety of drones, uh, which will conduct experiments during its voyage. And it will also be speaking with the International Space Station. So it's a really exciting opportunity for our students to, to get involved, um, not only during the voyage, but before and after it arrives. So Mrs. Reardon and I had a meeting with Plymouth 400 Executive Director, Michelle Pecoraro, uh, the managing director of the Mars Project in the UK. We also met with the Dean of Mass and Sciences at Bridgewater State University, as well as the Harbor Master and the Director of Marine and Environmental Affairs here in Plymouth, uh, as well as uh, Plymouth Patoxic Museums. So we're, we've formed a, a committee to start discussing, you know, these amazing opportunities and how we may connect our students at all levels um, with with this work. So we're really excited that this has come to fruition and uh, you know, very excited for the opportunities and the information that will be coming out in the coming months. So more to come regarding that. 
Um, I just wanna take a moment to mention the structured learning time revisions. Um, as I mentioned when we met previously, the Department of Education revised its structured learning time regulations. And as a result, Plymouth had to revise its hybrid model to increase live instruction or synchronous instruction, much like this is a synchronous opportunity to guarantee, and also to guarantee daily contact with teachers. So we have strived to achieve, as you know, some consistency across the district, while also giving each school and faculty the flexibility to structure teaching and learning in ways that best fit the needs of their students that they're serving. So uh, I'm very aware of many teachers that have found really creative ways to engage their students when they're at home outside of the district's hybrid plan. But having said that, the reason we needed to make revisions to our approved plan was because the universal plan that was designed and in collaboration with the EAPC, as you know, submitted to the Department of Education, fell short of these new regulations, which came out uh, later, uh, or, you know, this, this fall, uh, or actually early near the winter. It's important though, to note that, you know, um, every district's original reopening plan, just like ours, uh, was presented um, to the community through the school committee, approved by school committee, negotiated with our teachers and validated by the Department of Ed. It's really important to note that. Um, ours was um, no exception to that. So, you know, I'm really proud of the intensive process of deliberation and the revisions that ultimately led to our reopening plan this summer. Um, but having said that, you know, the department has asked us to modify our hybrid plan. We've actually been meeting with the APC well before this mandate came in from the state, starting actually back in November, hoping to make some minor adjustments to our plan. Again, we talked about that this evening, connections with students is, is, is really important in trying to make uh, as many opportunities as possible. So throughout this process, um, you know, we've been working with the team and, and we've been looking at the request from Desi, reviewing the data that we received from families, our staff and students, and just a lot of anecdotal information that we've received through conversations and meetings all year. So um, later this evening, Mr. Shothi will walk through the MOA uh, with the committee. Um, you know, I understand that many people, you know, they were are fine with the revisions to our structured learning time. Some have expressed that there should be more time allotted while others feel that the time allotted uh, won't be valuable. And all I can say is uh, to that is that we will continue to support everyone wherever they are in, in terms of this opinion uh, and their opinion. Um, I wanna convey that this will continue to be a work in progress. It needs to be. Uh, this whole year has been a work in progress as we evaluate, um, reflect, and try to get feedback. It, you know, it certainly won't be perfect on the first go around, um, but we realize that so many people, um, you know, want our students included more connections with their teachers. Um, so, you know, we're, we appreciate, I can appreciate, I should say, everyone's frustration because, you know, here is another adjustment to this, a new initiative in the middle of the year um, that we've had to rebuild everything really this year. So, um, you know, believe me when I say, I've felt similar frustrations since late spring and early summer when these changes came from the state you know, uh, at a very rapid pace, but I'm hoping that we can all you know, do our best to, to make it work, to try to improve it over time. Uh, and one thing I can say with certainty is that our leadership team, our principals, our coordinators, our directors will continue to provide any support necessary to make it work and improve it over time. Um, so I just wanted to, to make a comment about that. Um, also um, a reminder, we have our Saturday morning retreat this Saturday, uh, 8.30 to nine, we'll do some light refreshments and we should be finished no later than noon. Um, just wanted to remind everyone about that. Um, and then um, the last point I wanna make is uh, contract negotiations will begin soon. So as you know, we're coming to the end of our contracts and we'll be initiating the negotiation process very soon with the APC. Uh, the plan is to hold ground rule meetings remotely and then have in-person sessions for the subsequent meetings. Um, in previous no negotiations, uh, the this two person subcommittee members of the school committee attended the teacher negotiations. And I believe Mrs. Burgess and Ms. Haywood are the subcommittee members this year. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'll turn it over right now to Mr. Shofi for any additional comments that you might have, Eric. No, we're definitely in the um, beginning stages. Um, we've had communication with both Tom and Dale uh, to start negotiations. Um, we'll do the ground rules meetings probably by Zoom for both um, of the um, collective bargaining units. Um, probably towards the end of February is kind of where we're, we're looking at. A week of maybe when we return after um, our winter holiday, the week of February 22nd to try and get the rules meetings in. And then we'll have some structured times uh, we're all notified both Margie and Vedna if you guys are, are still going to continue with that, what the, the dates would look like. Um, if I understand correctly, um, you can come to different meetings, you know, we'd love to have representation. Um, the first couple will be a lot of the ideas and then we'll start really working through those. Uh, and then I've been in conversation with Roseanne as well uh, for her availability. So um, once I get some, some firm dates, I, I will certainly share those and uh, pass those along. If you have some dates that are you know, do not touch moments, dates, please get those to me so we can uh, avoid those. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, and that's all I have, Ms. Savory. I'm happy to answer any questions that my people Thank may have. You. Does anyone have anything, Ms. Burgess? Yeah, I just wanted to ask him back on, the, I'm so happy that that uh, Mayflower Autonomous ship is gonna yeah. come because it sort of died in somewhere for a while. And um, so when you say 419, is that when it leaves in England or when it arrives here? Correct. So th that is their anticipated departure date from oh, departure. England. Okay. Yep. And they're really looking at mid to late May, depending on the weather conditions. Um, and as we, you know, that, that may be something that will be, a, um, we'll have daily updates as they are getting nearer, depending on how the weather is, but it's, they're, they're anticipating a mid to late May arrival in, in Plymouth, Massachusetts, right. what I was told you. last week. You're welcome. Okay, does anybody have any other questions? Comments? All right, we're good, thank you very much. Thank you. So next we're going to move on to um, retirement announcements, Mr. Chofi. Yeah, well, first, tonight was good for me to listen to the high school principals. Uh, being a high school principal 15 years, I, I love to hear <laughs> what they're doing. Um, the theme was great, vision of graduates, and it's hard to believe in five months we'll have another group of students that will be uh, graduating. Uh, it's definitely kind of talks about the pathway. Uh, so tonight, I'm about retirement, so we have the vision of the retirees as well. And fittingly, we have a uh, staff member to recognize tonight from Plymouth South High School. Uh, Charles Goonan is a 22-year veteran at Plymouth South High School in the marketing education field. Uh, and he'll be retiring at the end of this year. So our, our students have a path and, and our staff have paths as well. So we want to wish uh, Charles the best of luck in the future. Great. And we'll turn it over to Ms. Badger. On behalf of the school committee, I'd like to wish um, Chuck a happy retirement. Um, he certainly deserves it and um, we will, he will be missed. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, moving right along, we have committee member reports. Does anybody have anything to report? No. Oh, Dr. Sorensen. Are we on, we're on reports and proposals from committee members? Yes, yeah. we are. Uh, you know, uh, I, Madam Chairman, I, uh, of, of the over 300 school districts in Massachusetts, we, we rank in the top 20 in terms of size. We're also ranked as above average. I think we should lend our voice to the letter to the governor regarding vaccines. I would like to see this school committee write a letter uh, to the governor following up the superintendent's uh, letter that went out, basically saying it is very important for those vaccines to come down to Plymouth and other school districts uh, to inoculate our teachers. Um, Dr. Sorensen, it's written and it's on our agenda to vote on tonight. I okay, wrote it. Thank you. So it's in the it's in the agenda. Um, we're going to vote on it um, after the EAPC. Um, Ms. Badger's already given me some edits, but we're going to discuss that. Okay, I see it. Thank you. All right. I, I, and I agree with you. That's why as soon as I found out everyone was doing it, I sat down and wrote my our, a letter on behalf okay. of us. Anybody else? Um, okay, I have a, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, I know that we talked about last Monday, the equity symposium with NSBA that's open to everyone 
um, free of charge, I believe it's next week. And I was just looking back through my memories and it was a year ago that I was there in DC. So that is coming up um, and that's free. You can go right on the NSBA website and register. Also, I believe Ms. Grimes sent out an email to everybody asking about the annual conference. Um, and I do believe too, I know it's really confusing and I, I know she put the price on there, but I believe that there's a special group rate um, because I know personally I'm interested, but I'm not interested in it at that price. So if for some reason we are to do the group rate, I would be interested, but um, if not, I'm, I'm not. So maybe everyone can look at it. We can talk about it on Saturday and, and see if anybody's interested in um, doing uh, the group rate. I think it's like buckets. And I, so I think that our entire board will fit in the first bucket for the group rate. And it is, I think it's pretty considerable, but we'll get confirmation. I have a conference call with Glenn Kucher tomorrow and I'll ask about that um, amongst the other things that I need to talk to him about. And, um, the other thing is I wanted to just let everybody know we've got a busy week ahead of us. Tomorrow night we have the vote for our um, temporary replacement for Ms. Trishelli's seat tomorrow night. Um, I believe that we're on the agenda for 7.15. And Saturday we have our um, winter retreat. And um, I just wanted to confirm, I know that it starts at nine o'clock. There's no end time on there. Do we decide on an end time? It's about 11.30. About 11.30, okay. So that's sooner than we thought. And hopefully our new member will have the availability to, to join us as well with that. Um, so that's everything that I have. Does anybody else have anything? All right, so next we have um, personnel reports. Back to, Dr. Uh, to Mr. Jeffy. All right, very good. Well, tonight we do have one certificated appointment three coach advisor appointments. We have five classified appointments, one unpaid leave of absence, three short-term parental leaves, and nine resignations to report to you this evening. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, Any? does anybody have anything for old business? Okay, seeing none, how about, um, does anyone have anything for new business? Okay. All right, so next we have a few action items before we get to our consent agenda. Uh, the first one is, and I think we jinxed ourselves last week. I, I know we did. did. Yeah. Um, we have a proposed um, revisal to our calendar that we approved last week. So Dr. Campbell. Thank you, Ms. Savory. I'll never again utter those words before <laughs> I present a calendar. I promise this is a very minor adjustment request. Um, apparently every 10 years, um, President's Day falls on the last Monday of February. Uh, so it's been 10 years since that occurred. We went back and looked at every calendar. So when we presented the calendar to you last week, our President's Day, um, which is typically when we do our February break um, or recess, um, is during that week. So um, we, we uh, in error, had it the week early. So the proposal this evening is to change the February or winter recess break to begin Monday, February 21st and conclude Friday, February 25th, um, as, as, it, as it always happens, right. as it always occurs during the President's Day That's week. That's not what my picture is. Ms. Fadgett, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I had um, sent Dr. Campbell an email uh, this weekend. Just I, my question is about, and we, the election day where it says election day on November 2nd. Thank you, Thank you for it, reminding me. Yeah. No problem. Um, and we, I did, I mean, I'm no election guru by any chance, but by any like dream of the imagination, but I did some Googling and I, I know that it is election day in the state. Of Massachusetts, it's um, but we as a town don't have any elections, and so I, that I could find, and so I just think that actually calling it election day might be a confusing to parents or anybody who looks at this um, sure. schedule. Sure. So we certainly, um, when we published the calendar, thank you, Miss Badger, for reminding me of that 
um, when we publish the actual formal calendar on our website, as well as the publication that goes out to our community members, we'll be sure to put that Tuesday as a professional development day uh, and not confuse anyone with election day that there'd be any election going on in the town of Plymouth. Okay, thank you. You're of welcome. course, check that, make sure that Pearl is good with that. <laughs> we, we, we'll before we do that. Dr. Sorensen, I see you have your hand up. Have the dates. Oh, Dr. Sorensen, you're muted. Sorry about that. I will make a motion to uh, to uh, uh, um, to approve the revised school calendar with the corrected uh, vacation time for the winter break in the next school year. Dr. Sorensen. Uh, I'll second it. And Mr. Morgan seconds it. Any discussion, Mark? Ms. Burgess? Yeah, I, can you give me the date of, the, of that again? Because it didn't seem to jive with what I have in my calendar. February 21st, 2022. Oh, 22. Okay. Yeah. Not the, yes. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right. Okay. I know the years are going by like that, Margie. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Before we take the vote, any other questions? Any other discussion? Okay. I'm just going to go in the order that I see everybody on my screen. Ms. Badger? Yes. Ms. Burgess? Yes. Dr. Sorensen? Yes. Mr. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Haywood? Yes. And I vote yes. So that is approved. And the next item that we uh, need to vote on is um, the EAPC M, uh, Memorandum of Agreement. And I, I'm assuming we're gonna turn this back over to Dr. Henry yeah. Ms. Sophie. Yes, thank you. Um, as Dr. Campbell pointed out, a large bulk of that was based on the student learning time that had come out from the state. Uh, but even before that, we started having conversations. So I'd like to thank Stacy for joining us and Dr. Campbell and then uh, Tom and his team uh, to get this worked on. Um, they did, uh, through the union, had it ratified earlier today. Um, so that, that was, that's certainly a good thing. Um, but just to highlight it, I know I've shared it with you, but there was really three main parts of the MOA for that is in front of you to vote on. Um, the first part dealt with a lot of the things we were dealing with in the fall when we had these mandatory quarantines and we had staff that were feeling well and they wanted to be able to participate, especially on things such as Remote Monday, um, but we didn't have that available to them. Um, plus, we had a lot some specialists, speech therapists, people that worked individually with students that could be out for an extended period of time. And then we were concerned that we weren't going to meet the, the needs of our students. So. Uh, the first part really talked about going forward um, when we came back in January for our staff to be able to work remotely if they're quarantined and if they're feeling okay uh, and they can work with their building level principals um, to make that happen and, and not be charged any of their sick time. Um, the, the other part, which you'd find later in the mm -hmm. document, was an extension of FFCRA as FFCRA expired on December the 31st. Uh, we still felt like there was, um, we're still in the pandemic. It didn't go away. We were going to have staff members that potentially would be come positive or be exposed. And we wanted to make sure that we took care of all of our employees. Uh, so we, we did a, uh, we fine tuned it a little bit. Uh, it wasn't as all encompassing as FFCRA, but we looked at the majority of the cases we dealt with and we felt like we were going to continue the program. Uh, it wasn't going to start over. So if, staff members have already utilized it first semester. They weren't going to get an additional uh, 10 days available to them. Um, so we, we did uh, continue that till March 31st uh, is our deadline for that. Uh, so we were excited to get that in there uh, to be able to work with our, all of our staff members uh, as, they're, as they're going through this time. Uh, and then the third big one, as Dr. Campbell mentioned earlier, was the uh, student learning time. And we had to really look at four different levels uh, we decided as, as a bargaining group that we were not going to do anything with the pre-K. Uh, we just left their schedules alone. Um, then we had the elementary level where kind of just summarizing the, uh, the staff, uh, the teachers were going to spend 15 minutes connecting daily with those students that were not in session. Um, and they were going to work on their own schedule to find out what time fit best for them, uh, providing that they just um, were very consistent with it for the family's sake. 
at the middle school level, they were going to spend 20 minutes with their core content teachers, um, but it was going to be done through a, a process of uh, over a two week period of time. Uh, so the students would have an opportunity over those four days in a two week period uh, to meet with their individual core teachers. Uh, and the, both the middle schools did a great job of, of kind of lining that up and working with their staffs to make that happen. Both of those schools started their process already on uh, the 21st of January. You know, we had that week of January 19th to get this implemented. Uh, we waited a little bit longer for the high school, which is the, our next and last level, uh, because that was going to be a little more um, work on our staff's part to try and get prepared for that. So we wanted to give them some additional time. So they're actually starting tomorrow. And what that is going to look like is the high school students for the first 20 minutes of each of their uh, courses will be logging in um, to join the classroom as the live students would be in class and the students at home would be together for the first 20 minutes. Uh, there was some language in there as well that um, if staff members were not, um, this wasn't going to be evaluative, it, you know, this wasn't going to be something that um, they would be, they would be permitted if, if they so choose to go a little bit longer, um, but we wanted to make sure that they knew that it was the 20 minutes was the goal. Uh, we also put in, in this uh, agreement that we would review it um, by March 5th, uh, just kind of evaluate, see where we, are, uh, where we are at and if there's any other adjustments. Uh, and then you might've seen down towards the bottom, there was a few other items. And I think Dr. Campbell's already um, kind of given us a direction as far as uh, pool. Um, we know we're not doing the pool testing, but he has the, um, the test available. Uh, for on a volunteer basis for staff. And uh, so that'll be something that we'll continue to look at. So that kind of summarizes that document that I shared with you. And uh, certainly if you have any questions, we can uh, we can answer those for you. Ms. Haywood. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of the um, FF, um, FFCRA, if this new bill is passed at the federal level, whatever may be included in it, would that supersede? They would. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What we had looked at was because there wasn't anything. What could we provide? So if the if we come out with something new, then yes, we would follow in line with that. Okay. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Just um, Mr. Kim, I mean Dr. Campbell. Just briefly, I did. I just want to say that I, I, you know, as Mr. Shoki said, the the high school revision I think is the most substantial, and I think that Karen and and Alex are probably agree with that. Um, this is really requiring our students when they're at home to, to log into their classes, their four classes each and every day. Our goal with this, and again, as Mr. Shobi said, teachers have the professional discretion to extend that if they want. Our goal here is not to do something separate and different when the students are at home, but really try to take advantage, <clears throat> excuse me, of the time when the students are in front of them, as well as the students that are remoting in to hopefully uh, do something that will be beneficial to both groups as well as take a little bit off the kids plates in my opinion when the kids are at home doing that independent work what I've heard from a lot of students and I think a lot of the feedback we got is the days the kids are home are particularly challenging because of the amount of work that they have and the lack of connection uh, you know the limited connection I should say you know seeing their teachers once a week at the high school level because of the schedule. So physically seeing your teachers. So really trying to take advantage of making that connection uh, and doing something that um, hopefully will be um, more engaging and, and take a little bit off the kids' plates in terms of the amount of work that they need to do to get that work done. So I know there's been a lot of work thrown at them. I've heard it from a lot of, a lot of students, read about it, had conversations with a lot. So I'm hoping as Mr. Shoki said, this is something that we will revisit in March. We, we plan on getting student feedback on this as well. Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, I, I certainly know that we have the technology to do it in our district. We're, we're very well suited that way. And as I said earlier in my comments, uh, you know, our principals, coordinators, directors, tech staff are, are there to provide the support um, to anyone who needs it. So. Okay. Um, Alex and, and um, Karen, do you have any anything or have you had any feedback that you'd like to contribute? Oh, Karen, you're muted. 
Oh, I didn't know if Alex was going to say anything. Oh, first. Okay. I was... <laughs> Student voice. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll go first then. Um, I think that it's definitely going to help some kids that are falling behind in school and like struggle with self pacing. Um, I mean, we haven't had a day like it yet, so I don't really know exactly what it's going to be like. I know. I definitely agree with Dr. Campbell. A lot of kids have had a lot of work. So if it somehow like helps with the workload that kids have had to do on their own, that would be very helpful. So. I, yeah, it's, I'm very mixed. I'm gonna be honest, I'm very mixed on it because at the same time, yes, this has been a personal choice for a lot of students to either participate or to not in their classes. And then, um, because we're so used to it. I think that for me, it's just another thing to adapt to. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, we definitely need more engagement because we've seen, you know, it's been really hard, a lot of workload, but then little time, especially when you take something like, you know, broadcast journalism, and then you have to like be in person and then do work at home. And it's really, it's really hard. So I hopefully that this goes well. I really hope so. Um, but again, I can't say too much positives because I'm still very mixed on it, just based on the fact that a lot of students have schedules and they have a routine already established. So for this to be somewhat of an obstruction for them, it can be di really difficult. So, And to kind of go off of that again, I know like we've talked about this in a few of my like student council meetings specifically with like teachers and stuff and they're just worried about like having to plan like for the 20 minutes like what do what do they do I think it's going to be hard to tell like how well it will go until we actually experience it but either way I think there will be positives and there will be negatives because that's just how things go so well we we look forward to your comments in the upcoming weeks I think you know that will that will help anyone else have anything all right, so I'll take a motion to approve the MOU or um, Ms. Burgess? Yes, I move that we approve the, uh, the APC memorandum of agreement. Thank you, a second, Ms. Badger? Any more further discussion? All right, we'll go ahead and take a vote. Uh, Ms. Badger? Yes. Ms. Burgess? Yes. Dr. Sorensen? Yes. Mr. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Haywood? And I vote yes. All right, that's all set. And then, oh, so the next item is um, the letter to the governor. And um, I really appreciate uh, Ms. Badger's input. Uh, it, it was just structural stuff, so it wasn't too bad, just moving a paragraph. Um, again, I wrote, it, I wrote it Wednesday night, fairly late. I wanted to make sure that I got it in time to go on to the agenda. Um, so if anybody has any comments, um, what, uh, again, hearing that um, other associations had done that, I thought that it was important for us to um, contribute as well. And I guess a, a couple of things that I, I'm asking, and then, and then you guys, if anybody has any edits or anything that they wanna make, I mean, if it's spelling and commas and stuff, we can do that later, but, um, if we make a motion to approve the letter, also um, I'm looking for your input as to whether or not you want me to sign it on behalf of you or if we all want to sign it. Um, it's totally up to the board. Um, so I would say whoever wanted to make that motion would include that part of it in the motion. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything to, that's pretty much all that I have. Um, okay. I feel that um, we were going to meet on Saturday and we have the opportunity. Maybe it would be more effective if all of us signed it. We'll, okay. Yeah. We'll be together. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I mean, it's a great opportunity. We never get that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree. Anybody else have any any anything to add, Mr. Morgan? Yeah, I just a quick question. It's a good letter and it's it's well intentioned, but since you know February first is um, start of phase two. And it's already agreed with the state that teachers are part of phase two. Is it kind of a mute point at this point to send the letter? I think they can move them up at any time, Dr. Campbell. Is that what everybody else is? 
hearing? Yeah, I think in the, the, the letter from MASS, it was moving, trying to move it up to phase one, essentially trying to make them uh, like essential um, um, first, trying to, trying to move them up in the, in the, in the order of the um, priority list. Mm -hmm. So phase one isn't over with yet. Well, it's never. Oh, it's never over, really. Like, um, because the, 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 so, and um, Miss Haywood has her hand up. Maybe yeah. Miss Haywood. So phase one started, I guess, in mid December, towards mid, towards late December, and I know that where I work, it, we had several phases of phase one, like several parts of phase one, and and if you think about it, so. If this were to, if the teachers were to receive the vaccine towards the end of February, most likely, you know, the beginning of um, March, that is just 50%. Mm -hmm. So that's 50% immunity. And now they have to wait another 28 days. So essentially another month in order to have full immunity. So it's another month plus essentially two weeks. Cause when you, by the time you get the injection, you need two weeks for that 50% mm -hmm. and then another two weeks for that. So we're now looking at, you know, April. Mm -hmm. if, if they get enough vaccine. And so by that time, and so we're not going to discredit like, um, uh, uh, reactions to the um, um, immunization, because I'm going to tell you, we've had a lot of reactions, especially to that second one, which leave people out of the loop, so you're gonna you're gonna be um, dealing with absenteeism and things like that. Um, uh, so it's a it, it's a lot, and so by that time, this is April, May. You know, uh, I would say at least end of April. So then we would only have like a month left for like school, and are we gonna bring them back? Mm -hmm. month. So um, so I guess time is like kind of of the essence. And then, given the fact that this variant that's coming into the U.S and how, how virulent it is. Um, and the fact that th this vaccine may not give that 90%, we wanna get as much like efficacy mm -hmm. you know, as possible. I would think if we all signed it on uh, Saturday, we could send it that day yeah. too. So um, thank you, we, I appreciate that. I know, I know, and I think I did mention in the letter that we understand that Plymouth in general is having a problem getting the vaccinations. I know I'm trying to help my parents schedule, it is impossible. And by no means are we asking them to replace somebody else that's in line. We just wanna make sure that we get enough for everybody. Ms. Badger? I was just gonna say one thing that I would like to see and I, um, is that it, instead of using educators that we use school staff and I'd also like to add bus drivers. I think that's really important. I think that's a group of people that I know. Um, I mean, I have families, who, family members who are bus drivers and just how that is impacting them as well. And so I feel like that's a really important piece for us to add here. And to go back to your point, I think that we should be kind of clear in the letter that Plymouth literally has no sites within 25 miles. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, I think we should be using the, what is it? The TJ Maxx in next to Kohl's. I mean, there's a parking lot and there's nothing being used. So I, and there's so many places in the Kingston mall. So I think that just putting that piece in there too also is a reminder for the governor. If, I know that the people. <laughs> I know that the Beth, the Beth Israel Leahy group now um, has Pia one. It closed out. Yeah, out, they have that. Taken, but we still can't book appointments because I'm in the over 75 level, you know, and I've got a couple of COVID, you know, problems. So, uh, mm -hmm. and I can't get an appointment either yet. But that is the uh, site that they've gotten in Plymouth. So somebody's gotten a site, but it's yeah, but they don't have the vaccinations. They have the site, but we don't have the vaccinations. We either. don't have the we don't have the medication. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can, right. yeah, can do a you thing. You need that. Out. It's important. Dr. Sorensen? Uh, Ms. Badger, I have to, I have to uh, respectfully not agree with your inclusion of bus drivers. I thought about this last week. And the reason why I think we shouldn't include them, first of all, they're not, we don't employ them. The bus drivers that we employ, and we do have some bus drivers that we employ, we ought to provide them the uh, vaccines. If we were to go publicly and say that we were going to include bus drivers, then their organization, their supervisors, the, the people who own uh, First Student will be off the hook. 
oh, well, don't worry about them. Plymouth's taking care of them. I would rather have we'll vaccinate our employees and let the bus people vaccinate, vaccinate their employees. Okay, any other questions before we take a motion? I will entertain a motion if somebody wants to figure out how to word it. <laughs> no one? Ms. Badger? I just wonder, I mean, I could be the only one that thinks that bus drivers should be included. And I totally get what Dr. Sorens is saying. I get his, um, his, his, his thought process there. But I also think that bus drivers, if we don't have bus drivers, if our bus drivers get COVID, we have no way to get the kids to school. So that is where my brain is there. It's also wanting to make sure that they feel safe and in, um, in their daily job. But I think it's important that we protect our bus drivers as well. Okay. Well, we can have discussion if we anybody wants to make a motion. If not, then we won't do it, I suppose. Mr. Morgan? Uh, I'll make a motion and approve the, the letter as written. Okay. I do have some minor edits, gra grammatical edits. Subject to gr grammar, gr grammar um, corrections. And, and do you want to add that we all signed it on Saturday? I, I, I'm in favor of that. So yes, I like that, make that part of the motion. Right. Do I have a I'll second? second it. Right. Any more discussion? No. All right. We'll go ahead and take a vote. Uh, Miss Badger. Yeah. Miss Burgess. Yes. Mr. Dr. Sorensen. Uh, I have to apologize. Uh, I was out of town and got in very late today, and I missed this item on the agenda. So I am going to abstain because I haven't had a chance to read it. Okay. Mr. Morgan. Yes. And Ms. Haywood? Yes. And I vote yes, so it passes and we'll make sure that we have it on Saturday to um, sign. sign. Yes, and, and we'll send right away. And Dr. Sorensen, if you have any other additional things, we can always bring it up again, I, I think on a Saturday, if you have any changes or let me know. I appreciate that, thank you. All right, moving right along, we have the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Or does anybody need to pull anything out? Dr. Sorensen. Uh, the minutes. Okay. You need to pull them out? Yes. Okay. Do I have a second to pull out the minutes from the consent agenda? Do I need a second? Oh, okay. okay. So do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda without the minutes? I move we approve the consent agenda without the minutes. Okay. And do I have a second, Ms. Haywood? Second? And any discussion? Okay, so we'll vote on the approval of the consent agenda without the minutes. Uh, Ms. Badger? Sorry, I, I- Where did you go? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> yes. You messed up my order now, though. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Uh, Ms. Burgess. Yes. Dr. Sorensen. Yes. Mr. Morgan. Yes. Ms. Haywood. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. So the consent agenda minus the minutes are approved. And now we will discuss the minutes. Dr. Sorensen, did you have? Yes. Just one, just one correction. Uh, on the bottom of page two, the second paragraph from the bottom references, and I'll read it, unknown expenses related to long-term remedial needs. It should read unknown expenses related to long-term social emotional needs. Change the word remedial to social emotional. Okay. That's it. Anything else? Nope. Okay. So we'll take a motion. Mr. Morgan? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes um, as amended. Okay. Ms. Badger, are you seconding? Is that what it was? Okay. All right. Any more discussion on the minutes? Okay. And Ms. Burgess? Yes. Ms. Uh, Dr. Sorensen? Yes. Mr. Morgan? Yes. And Ms. Haywood? Yes. See, Ms. Badger, you're last now. Ms. Badger? <laughs> Yes, I, my space bar is not working. <laughs> so the minutes are um, 
approved with the changes. All right, so that brings us to the end of our meeting. So thank you everyone and we will see you all tomorrow. So I know we're all gonna got a lot of decision making to make. So um, thank you everybody and have a, a safe and warm night. Thank you, good night. Right, meeting adjourned. Thank you guys. Thank you, Karen and Alex for Yes, thank thank yeah. you.